We're talking today with Walter Lissy of San Antonio, Texas, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, start us off with some background on yourself, and to begin with, where and when were you born? I was born at home in McCook, Texas, a rather remote area. What part of Texas is that in? Very uh, southern Texas on the Mexican border, All right. near, near the Rio Grande Valley. Okay, and did you grow up there or did you move around? I grew up there, and then uh, after high school, uh, attended Texas A&I University in Kingsville, Texas. Okay. Now, when you were growing up, what was your family doing for a living? We were uh, dry land farmers in the 50s in Texas, which was the, the, uh, the time of the drought. Okay. So it was pretty tough. <laughs> we were very poor. All right. How were you able to afford to go to college? Um, didn't really couldn't afford. I had enough money to pay my first semester's tuition and live for about a month or two. Okay. Uh, I tell everybody I held every job in Kingsville, Texas. <laughs> How large was the school in those days? Uh, about 4,000 okay. students and they had ROTC and I joined ROTC. And, uh, but basically just had odd jobs running, uh, filling stations and so forth and I finally got me a good job at the Kingsville Naval Air Station driving fuel trucks and fueling jets at night. Okay. Had a 40 hour a week job there and went to school full time. So you didn't do a lot of sleeping then? Well, uh, my joke was for, I got off at, from midnight to 8 o'clock the next morning, it was free time. You could do anything you wanted to, like study or sleep. Or <laughs> All right. Now, the ROTC program you were in, was that an Army ROTC? Army ROTC. Uh, and by, back then, uh, they were actually uh, by branch, and it was Signal Corps. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what did the ROTC training actually consist of? Well, you had to take, uh, obviously, military courses through four years, um, uh, drill and ceremonies out in the break field, see Sergeant Martin and clean your M1 rifle every week to his... Uh, Till he was satisfied, mm -hmm. so you got really good at cleaning an M1, disassembling and assembling, and so forth. And um, of course, between your junior and senior year, you go to a summer camp for six weeks, pretty intensive uh, training. Mm -hmm. And when you graduate, you're commissioned. All right. Uh, now, was this a place that had a four-year ROTC, and you? Yes, four year, four years ROTC. Okay. But it was small. Okay. Uh, compared to like Texas A&M or someplace. And back then, I don't remember precisely, but on graduation night, I think five of us were commissioned. Okay. Very small. All right. Uh, and now, did, does the, did the military pay for any part of your education, or was this just... You, you got at your junior and senior years, uh, I think we got $40 a month. Okay. Uh, paid for it, uh, cleaning your uniform and haircuts. So no, you didn't... It wasn't for money. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, Ben, how did you feel about the prospect of going into the Army? Was that something you wanted to do, or...? Uh, yes. It was a job. Okay. <laughs> Back then, things were tough. All right. And so I, what, what I, year did you graduate from college then? 19... Uh, in May of 65, I graduated from Texas A&I. Okay. Interesting time to go into the Army at that point. How... Were you aware at all of what was happening in Vietnam or overseas? Yes. And back then... Um, People were in ROTC and they saw Vietnam coming and they figured out how to get out of ROTC. And, and then the Army uh, changed its policy and you had to sign up some paperwork that you were a private in the Army Reserves. Mm -hmm. And if you decided to, to, for some reason, just quit, you end up being coming into Army as a private. Mm -hmm. So there was incentive. But that, would, that didn't affect me. I was, I was hoping to get commissioned and go into the Army. Okay. All right. So now once you receive your commission, now what do they do with you? Well, the first thing you do is go to officer's basic training at Fort Gordon, Georgia. And then uh, you get your first assignment. My first assignment was at uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky okay. in a uh, training center. So just to back up a little bit, what do they do in officer's basic training? Um, <clears throat> most of it is uh, related to uh, signal corps. Um, equipment and this sort of thing, plus the, you know, the normal PT test and training and, and so forth. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, by, then, by then you're pretty well trained as, to, as far as 
drilling yeah. ceremonies and all yeah. that. That's already done. Okay. Now, what kind of equipment was the Signal Corps using at that point? Well, um, actually, the, uh, the the radios at the, at, the, at that level were the PRC twenty five, which then um, had it had one vacuum tube in it, which eats a lot of battery. And that was changed to the PRC-77 with the transistors uh, version. Mm -hmm. It did, did the same thing, although you'll talk to almost all the Vietnam vets and they'll all tell you about the A PRC-25. Mm -hmm. They were actually carrying a PRC-77. Okay. It looked exactly the same. Everybody thought it was a PRC-25, and that's what they called okay. it. But well, they also talk about carrying around extra batteries. Did the 77 still need those? Oh, yes. And the batteries were big and heavy and were a, a, a really a, an important thing that, that, that you know, to uh, make sure that everybody had a fresh battery. Mm -hmm. But even before that, when they were still PRC-25s, they ate the batteries a lot faster because they had a vacuum tube which uses a lot more power. So the, the yeah. Army got changed that to a PRC. Okay. Did you also do stuff that learned things that had to do with, with coding and anything like that? Oh, yes. Encryption and... Yes, and uh, during my time with 2nd and 506, which we'll talk about, that was a, a big deal, of having a secure radio and okay. codes. So. All right, so now, you, and so how long was the uh, training uh, for Gordon? Eh, I don't know, six or eight weeks. Okay, so no, not a big thing then. Yeah. Okay, uh, so then Fort Knox, Kentucky then is your next stop? Yes. Okay, what do you do there? <clears throat> Is, uh, Fort Knox was a major training center back then for basic training, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But I was in uh, what was called a radio school, or teaching uh, radio operators. Uh, 05B was the MOS. They became radio operators, and many, many of them went to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, looking back at it now, I think it's silly because the majority of the time was teaching them international Morse code. And boy, if I had to do it all over again, I would uh, go back and take that training time and teach them how to be a company commander's radio operator mm -hmm. and do stuff like calling in airstrikes and and because uh, that's what the real job was. And almost none of them used the international Morse code and that, that was a, oh, probably two to three hundred hours of training. So where would they use international Morse code? Would that be if you went to Europe or something for a big headquarters or? Um, basically, most radio operators didn't do it. Now, special forces did it a lot. And we'll talk mm -hmm. about that later. But uh, most army radio operators did not use international Morse code, but it was still in a training program. And okay. they had to pass 13 words a minute international Morse code, and it was taught to them. And, uh, very rudimentary way was pure memorization. Did A, ah, it's A. Okay. Okay, and you're right. Did A, did A, ah, and then the other and B was Da, did it. it. Okay. Yeah. Now, how long did you spend at Fort Knox doing that? Two years. Okay. And, and during that time, I mean, did you want to go to Vietnam or not go? Oh, to I, I was fully expecting to go to Vietnam. Okay. I, and my, my commitment was for two years. Okay. I could have just left. Uh, Fort Knox and I'd fulfilled my military obligation and I'd probably been put in the reserves and sent home. Yeah, okay, but you stayed in. But I stayed in. All right, why did you stay in? Uh, I liked the Army, you know, and patriotic reasons and so forth and it's time to go do my thing. Okay, uh, so what thing did you go do next? Well, I got my orders for Vietnam, except it didn't say Vietnam, it said Thailand. Okay. And I said, well, where's Thailand? <laughs> <laughs> so, in the summer of 67, uh, uh, out to Travis Air Force Base and get on this uh, contract airplane, which is totally full of Air Force. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was, I think, four of us Army people on this airplane. And we fly to Bangkok. Okay. And what did they do with you once you get to Bangkok? Got, got the airport in Bangkok, everybody unloaded. All these little blue Air Force base buses came and picked up all these Air Force guys and they left and we stood there looking at each other. Well, what do we do? <laughs> so we finally figured it out. 
Well, but did um, someone come for you, or did you just uh, stand around? They, they told us to take a taxi and go to the Chapia Hotel in Bangkok, which we did. And that was a, a contract hotel and for Army, and we went in there and uh, made contact and pretty soon started getting assignments. Okay. And what did you get assigned to? Well, <clears throat> my initial assignment was to go to Karat, uh, 501st Field Depot, which is a large depot operation, logistics, bringing in supplies into Thailand. And they found out that I had a secret clearance, <laughs> which is unusual back then. Mm -hmm. So uh, the uh, depot petroleum officer and I had to get together and spend the first month writing a secret plan on how to distribute, how to distribute petroleum to the air bases in Thailand. Which is uh, lots of air bases in Thailand. Mm -hmm. Yes, so we did that, and when that was finished, then uh, I was sent to Sadahit, Thailand, which is on the coast south of Bangkok, where the U.S. was building a large uh, port facility, mm -hmm. and all supplies were coming into Sadahit. So I joined from there. I was, uh, and I'm still, a, I'm a first lieutenant, and. Um, uh, I uh, joined a 596 quartermaster company, Petroleum Depot. Okay. There's only two. There were only two petroleum companies in the army, and that's one of them. And I was the signal platoon leader. The company was supposed to be spread out 200 miles of pipeline with teletype and all this sort of thing. Well, we weren't deployed like that at all. We were all in one one spot. Okay. And you really didn't have a lot of signal to do. So the next thing I knew, I was also the company motor officer running the motor pool, which is a big motor pool. Uh, big 5,000 gallon petroleum tankers, deuce and a half, uh, rough terrain forklifts uh, for moving large drums around, and just a lot of equipment. Okay. Was that all staying on the base, or was that going back and forth along the pipelines? Well, <clears throat> when I first got there, what the, what the mission well, our mission was to handle all petroleum products for Thailand, but mm -hmm. our real mission was bringing in JP-4 for the Air Force. And they would come in in tankers, and when I first got there, they used submarine cables to attach to the tankers to pump the uh, JP-4 off the tankers mm -hmm. and into pipelines and, and to Utapau Air Base. And uh, then by uh, just that Christmas time, we got our petroleum pier built, which is a new modern pier in the port, pipelines, you could actually drive a jeep out on it and had the big anchor points for tankers to come in and um, get tied up mm -hmm. and we would pump off, off of that. But this is what's interesting is that a lot of air power came out of Thailand for the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. Places like Udorn, Uban, Tak Li, the Kong Phanom, Karat, and had all these basically fighter bombers scattered out throughout Thailand, and uh, they burned a lot of fuel. But in southern Thailand, next to us, next to the port, was uh, Utapau Air Base. And Utapau had B 52s and KC 135 tankers. And these tankers would take off and be airborne, and there was really basically no fuel at all these air bases in Thailand. They only had minimal amounts for testing engines and emergencies. So when that F-105 took off out of Karat, loaded with bombs and so forth, he took off and immediately went to the tanker, mm -hmm. which came out of Utapau. He got a load of fuel, he went north, did his mission, mm -hmm. came back, <coughs> hit the tanker, got fuel and landed. And the whole war went like that. Okay. So we were pumping out of <clears throat> And uh, we averaged 1.2 million gallons a day pumping uh, JP-4 to out mm -hmm. That was our main mission. Okay. And we, uh, when I first got there, we, <coughs> eventually we had electric pumps and this, uh, we had a very large tank farm. One tank was a uh, 100,000 barrels. <laughs> huge, <laughs> you know, other tanks, and we handled, you know, other products too, 
uh, gasoline and diesel and this sort of thing, but it's primarily JP4. And uh, ships would come in, <coughs> we'd offload them, they'd take off, go back to uh, the Persian Gulf and get another load of fuel, another ship would come in, and they'd hold about 10 million gallons each, and that was a, a week's supply. And, and we'd pump that all over to the pile. And so we just, uh, Eventually, uh, I had a single platoon, a motor platoon, and then I became the company commander. Okay. Totally out of my field, but uh, that's what All I right. that's what Now, I, were you still a first lieutenant at that point? No, I just got promoted to captain okay. and became the company commander. Very good. Yeah. Now, what, what, what's daily life like? On a, 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 you're, you're on a big base, right? You're, no. Or you're just out somewhere? The Army had a, a small camp at that point called Camp Vayama. Uh, it basically didn't even have a, a fence around it. Water buffaloes just wandered right okay. through our area. So they built a had port a facility, <coughs> but you're not, but not really a base. Yeah. The, 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 eventually, there was a, a new army post, Camp Samisan, mm -hmm. but at this point, it, it hadn't been built yet. So ours, okay. we were just had wooden hooches, pull a rope, and lifts up a piece of tin for your window. Uh, but compared to Vietnam, it was super good. We had showers. <laughs> we had a little building called the Officers Club where you could eat. Uh, it, was, it was okay. Okay. Do you employ local people to work for you, or? Uh, yes. Every hooch had a house squirrel that shined shoes and took your uh, fatigues down the river and beat them with rocks and <laughs> cleaned them and brought them back. And so yeah, it was the life there was okay. And did you have any security concerns? Because it wasn't. Uh, yes, particularly at the air base. In fact, there was, if you read back in history, they actually got on to Utapau and um, damaged some B-52s. Okay. Yeah. Now, were these Thai communists or were they Vietnamese infiltrators or do you not know? I, I don't know a, a lot about that. Okay. But, but where you were, there wasn't any particular... No, we were, we, were, we were probably 30 minutes away. At our, at our army camp. Mm -hmm. Eventually the new camp was over closer to Utapau, but our, our little uh, camp was mm -hmm. kind of remote and all by itself. All right. Okay. So how long did you spend there? Uh, I, st <clears throat> I stayed there uh, about, uh, if I recall, eight or nine months, and then I went to, uh, well, what happened is that uh, the Army Petroleum Officer out of the Pentagon came, some Air Force Colonel, and uh, he found out that he had a single <laughs> guy <laughs> commanding one of his <laughs> petroleum companies, and he was very upset about that. <laughs> okay. And so pretty soon there was a, another uh, uh, captain took over, and I went to Karat and uh, worked in, in logistics and maintenance, finished my tour. And, Okay. So yeah. when did that tour finish? In July of uh, 68. Okay. So you've been in Thailand at the time of the Tet Offensive then? Yes. All right. Did that have any reverberations where you were? Not really, no. Okay. All right. Uh, so July 68, now you go back to the States. And you just had you decided by this time to really make a career in the Army? Yeah, I was pretty well staying in. Okay. Yeah. All right. So what's your next assignment now? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> got orders to go to Fort Bragg to the Special Warfare School, which is the Special Forces uh, school. Okay. So did you take Special Forces training or were you going no, to work I was, I was just assigned to go there. Okay. And I got there and, <clears throat> and the next thing I know I'm um, in the communications committee of the Special Forces school. It's, it's back then called Special Forces Training Group. Okay. We have Special Forces groups. There's first group, second group, fifth group in Vietnam, and so forth, mm -hmm. and then there's a training group at Fort Bragg okay. that teaches the uh, the officer training and the various uh, skills and special forces, weapons, engineer, signal, operations, those sorts of things, and we were doing the communications portion of that. All right, so what does that actually consist of? Soldier comes there are exceptions to this, but basically a soldier comes in the Army, goes to basic training, then he goes to airborne school, then he goes to special forces basic training, right. and then after that, he, then he goes to his MOS training. Mm -hmm. Then he'd come to us now, and he's already been in airborne school, he's had, had some, uh, some 
jumps already, mm-hmm. and uh, and then he uh, becomes a special forces radio operator. Now he's learned international Morse code, but he's going to use that. Okay. Because when you go to an A camp in Vietnam, you're sitting there using international Morse code, and he's and so that was uh, a really important training for them there. And an important thing is, is at the point I got there, this was already going on, but you know, how do, how do you learn international war scope? The dits and the das and so forth. Well, there was a fellow out of California, his name was Judson Cornish. He was not a, a communicator or anything else, but he was uh, had a PhD in how the brain works. Mm-hmm. So his way of explaining this, he says, you know, if I says, you know, do you know music? No, I don't even know how to read music. But if I played Happy Birthday on the uh, piano and hit all these keys and so forth, and I made a mistake, you would know it, wouldn't you? He goes, yeah. He says, you listen to, to a song on the radio, and you like the song about the second time, and without even thinking about it, you're, you, you, you know the words. Mm-hmm. How'd that happen? So he came up with this mnemonic method of teaching international Morse code. And uh, you basically uh, put on a headset, and there's a male voice talking to you. And he says, alone, and you write down A, and he says, brake cylinder. He writes down B, he says, daredevil, you write down D. And what it is, like the word along, is a short syllable and a long syllable, da-da. Mm-hmm. Then you hear brake cylinder, which is da, da 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 Okay. But you don't pay any attention to the code. Mm-hmm. You're just writing down, you know, there's probably, very few people in the world know this story, by the way. Okay, so. You listen to this male voice telling you this, and you write it down, and you have an attenuation uh, knob. And then, while he's saying the words, there's a little bit of code synchronized with this. And as you, you're bringing the voice down, you bring the code up. Okay, and you get to a certain point, and you start out at 13, 15 words a minute. This is not boring. I mean, just, you're right. And then he <clears throat> changes. Change the male voice to the chipmunks. <laughs> chirpy voice. Yeah. Terrible. Hello. You know, and the code is there. And then pretty soon you bring the chipmunks down, you bring the code up, and pretty soon the chipmunks go away and you're copying code. And I actually did this at lunch hours in, I don't know, two, three weeks. I learned code. Okay. Uh, but then, you know, most people struggle for many, many hours trying to learn this. But it all ended up that he had his way of doing things, and some army people had their way of doing things, and they were not the same, so they told him to take his toys and go home. Mm-hmm. And the world lost that. Oh, well. So guess what, how we're teaching today? Mm-hmm. Back to the old way of doing things. It's, yeah, but uh, okay. it, it was just, that's just an interesting story. That right. We had one soldier, he was a prize soldier. He. He learned at, at 15 words a minute solid in 12 hours of training. Now, most people would take like, you know, uh, probably 75, 100 hours, but mm-hmm. this guy just, it worked for him. Boom. He went through the tapes, learned it, and said, he's ready. Mm-hmm. 12 hours of training, that guy, you cope. <laughs> Which is very unusual. But at this school, uh, not only did they come in, they learned the code. And then they learn equipment. Uh, basically, they learn uh, a lot of uh, basic how to build antennas, how antennas work, which antenna to use, because they're going to be using um, uh, um, ANGRC 109 radio transmitter and a receiver with a hand crank generator. There's no microphone here. This is all build an antenna and tap out the code. Mm-hmm. And the last. Uh, I got there, my boss was a Colonel Johnson. He had just finished a commanding CCN in Vietnam, which is back then very classified, putting the guys into North mm-hmm. Vietnam and all the recon teams and so forth. So I, I get there and he's there and he says, the last two weeks of the course is a, a field training exercise in the mountains of North Carolina called Lindville Falls, the Pisgah National Forest. And, uh, Colonel Johnson said, why are we trucking these soldiers up there? 
These are special forces soldiers. You go up there and establish your drop zone. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Sergeant O'Boyle and that's O'Boyle and I, he's, he's been on this, he knows that area, mm -hmm. knows people. We go up there and uh, make relations with uh, a farmer, uh, John Dooley, not Tom Dooley, but John Dooley. He has a farm in a uh, small bit in the mountains. Mm -hmm. How do you find a drop zone in the mountains? But the train would drop down 600 feet, go across the farm, and then go back up 600 feet. And you're flying at 1,200 feet and drop, you know. And it's a nice farm, it's kind of flat, but it had barbed wire fences crisscrossing it with steel posts, uh, creek on two sides, uh, an old apple orchard. But so we established that drop zone, and uh, Air Force could never find it. <laughs> because you're flying low, it's just mountains. You know. But I, I knew how to find it, so I, I could direct them and we'd find a drop zone. And then we started uh, jumping. You could only get four guys out the door, though. That's how quick it was. Okay. So we did that for a couple years of uh, using that drop zone. And I don't know, it's imagine nowadays what it would take to, to do something like that. Well, back then, you just go out there and do it. That's the way it was. And then did the people have problems with the barbed wire fences or things nope. like that? And these guys were, and I had enough training by now. We had the MC1 maneuverable parachutes. Okay. They're kind of maneuverable. Mm -hmm. they had like, I think, 42 square feet hole in the back, and you could slip your risers. And they were well briefed, and they knew this was a challenge for them. First time they're not on a great big drop zone mm -hmm. uh, at, you know, at Fort Bragg or. Something like that, and then nobody ever got hurt. We all got them in, jumped in, and then from there they would um, go out to the field, and they had a four-man team. Uh, they build their own shelters out of ponchos. They had to get on the ground with that hand crank generator, build antennas, and transmit a message encoded back to their buddies at Fort Bragg on a. A frequency at a time and then on a different frequency at another time they had to receive a message and decode it and if they were successful in this it would give them some grid coordinates and a password where to get food because they only had three meals of sea rations <laughs> all right so the next meal is they had to accomplish that and there's a lot of funny stories there but uh, they, they, they did it and, and they had to uh, learn to communicate from high ground, low ground, down in Linville Gorge, different situations, different antennas, and they, it was good training. They they learned a lot. Okay. I would expect a group like this would have pretty high morale. Oh yes, they were all guys. volunteers. Uh, I, I, yes, I was the captain in charge, but I had a group of NCOs that were whole special forces. Mm -hmm. uh, trained, experienced. I learned more from them from any school would ever teach me. So I, I, got, I, I got a lot of training while I was with that unit uh, and all kinds of stuff. All right. So you're there now, uh, you know, late 60s in the 1970, 71 or? Yes, um, this was till um, 60, this is 68 to 70. Okay. But that's a period when the anti-war movement at home was heating up quite a bit. Yes. Does, does that register with you or where you are, or were you not really worrying about it very much? Yeah, it registered with me, but yeah, I didn't, it didn't really affect me that much at that point. Uh, you, know, you know, we had a, a war going on, and we had a lot of good soldiers and getting hurt and killed. And, and the community around Fort Bragg would have been, was that fairly yeah, pro military? That's, yeah. yeah, that's our army community. Right. Okay, uh, so now you've got this for two years, and so uh, now did you want to go back to Viet? Did you want to go to Vietnam? Because you well, had I was ex there? fully expecting to go to Vietnam. Okay, and I got orders. All right. Yeah. So when do you go to Vietnam? July of seventy. Okay. Uh, of course, individual replacements. Get an airplane, go to Vietnam. You get off the airplane, you go to this place, Benoit, I guess it was, mm -hmm. and uh, there were three signal captains 
on this airplane. And we got there, and there was another single cap that was there already. And then a big bulletin board. You go look at the board when your name comes up that tells you what your assignment's going to be. Well, that captain was there already. He got an assignment, 101st Airborne Division. <laughs> Whoa! Poor guy. Okay. So, so, why, so why? we go back, and a few hours later, we go back there, and here's all of our names. Oh, we're all going to 101st. All right. So why is it poor <laughs> boy if he's going to 101st? Well, 101st, and that was, we knew then, was the only division left uh, in Vietnam that was fully engaged in fighting the war. Mm -hmm. Everybody else, the 4th Division, was being taken down, and you know, people were going home. Nixon mm -hmm. was bringing the troops home. Right. Except for the 101st was still up in I Corps and fully engaged. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. All right. So how do you uh, get from Benoit up to uh, Well, that first? night, uh, I wake you up in the middle of the night, grab your duffel bag and you get on a C-130 and we took off and we started flying north for a long time. I said, my God, we got to be in China by now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, we, they flew us all the way to Dong Ha. Wow. All right. And uh, we stopped there and some people got off and then they flew back to Fubai and uh, got off the airplane and there we were at uh, Camp Eagle. <laughs> And that's the headquarters for headquarters 101st Airborne. Headquarters for 101st. All right. Next thing they do is uh, transport you north to Camp Evans. And um, you're uh, going to go to Screaming Eagle Replacement Training. Everybody has to go to search training before you can join a unit out in the field. Which, you, I look back now, it was important. Mm -hmm. What did that training consist of? Uh, firing weapons. Uh, even like the 90 millimeter recoilless uh, M60 machine guns, your basic M16s, you're getting refamiliarized with all these weapons. Uh, a lot of air mobile, as we knew it back then. Uh, you actually uh, jump on helicopters and fly out and do air, air assaults just to learn how that's going to work. Get familiar with art, artillery, breaking in artillery. Um, <clears throat> uh, Cobras, rockets, all the things are going to be happening to you when, once you go out to the field. Okay. All right. Uh, and how long does that last? That's um, a week. Okay. And at that point, ripcord was going on because this is. Uh, I think I got out of search training on the. Um, 21st or 22nd. Okay. And you could see, you could actually, when the Chinook crashed at Ripcord, we're sitting in the stands looking at this column of smoke up there. Okay. In, the, in the evening, you're watching Chinooks haul in damaged uh, helicopters. A lot of activity going on. Yeah, the Chinook crash is, is July 18th. And then they yeah, actually... That makes sense, 18th, 19th, 20th, 21 yeah. yes. And then the 23rd is when they actually pull off the base entirely. Yes, 23rd is when they pull okay. off the base. On the, 20th, on the 23rd, I was finished uh, training, and I had to go to Camp Eagle to see the division signal officer who does all the assignment of signal officers. And uh, so we... Uh, Went, went there, and it was Colonel Smart was his name, and he says, you're going to 2nd of 506th Infantry. Then he told me about Colonel Lucas being killed that day and all the casualties and ripcord and how they pulled off. And So that was the 23rd, the next morning I joined the unit. All right, so let's, so basically what happens? You send out, you go out to join the unit? <clears throat> You, know, you go to Camp Evans and you go to this unit and he had just pulled off a ripcord the day before mm -hmm. and things are not normal. <laughs> you still start hearing all of these statistics and stories and talking to people. They're all talking to each other and the first thing that happened was a, was a uh, memorial service lined up the, Battalion, they had a little stage. Chaplain Fox, the battalion. Chaplain gets up. 
rifle stack boots half battalion crying it was just an emotional wreck I mean it's it was bad who was in charge of the battalion at that point John C Bard was a new battalion commander okay so he'd already been installed well that or just arrived just arrived yeah in fact uh, major I'm gonna say King okay. was the XO of the battalion mm -hmm. and he had just come back from R&R &R in Hawaii now when I got there I reported in to him mm -hmm. uh, Colonel Bard was just I don't know if he had, was there yet but he was coming aboard that day so I, I go and report to the XO battalion XO he looked at me and he looked at my signal flags and he jumped up and ran out of the room. <laughs> I looked around, well, what's this about? Because prior to that, John Darling was a signal officer. He was a West Pointer and he got killed. Mm -hmm. Ripcord. And uh, Captain Hopke was sent by a division temporarily mm -hmm. to fill that slot. Well, Hopke was short. He was going home. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I'm there to replace him. But you can imagine uh, this major that with his the battalion commanders dead, the operations officers dead, all these people are injured or scattered to four winds. Mm -hmm. And of course personnel accountability is really an important thing. And he looked at me and he says, Oh my god, did I miss what did I miss? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Where's my signal officer? So he ran out. He came back shaking, okay, Hopkins going home. Okay, you're the new guy. So but he was, yeah, so he got that done. It was, it was uh, crazy. There was a little officer's club there. You go in there and you hear all of these stories and names and experiences. And, and good Lord, what kind of unit did I join here? <laughs> right. The last 23 days, they had what, uh, something like 72 guys killed and 250 or something injured. And this, what, this I'm going to be in this unit for a year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> of course, it wasn't like that after that. It okay. was. All right. So, what was Colonel Bard like? Uh, Colonel Bard was a Rhodes Scholar, West Point graduate, Rhodes Scholar, brilliant man. Uh, and uh, I, I, I don't. I want to say a few things, but I want everybody to know that I admired him. He's, he's okay. a super guy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just a brilliant guy, but he had very little common sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you've seen me. You've seen like the, the brilliant people who had a hard time tying their tie or something. You know? Yeah. But he was, and as, don't, don't get me wrong, he was he, he was a good commander, and he really cared for his troops and this sort of thing. But um, I thought he was uh, in the wrong place. He was put there to punch his ticket, mm -hmm. get his ticket punched, and he didn't last till I think by. I'd, I'd have to go back and review the records, but he was there long enough to get an OER and uh, move up to be a division operations officer. I mean, a big job, and I'm sure very good at it and brilliant at it, but he wasn't a, 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 a dig in the dirt infantry guy, mm -hmm. you know, type of guy. Right. So, so what, what actually now happens with the battalion once you join it? Do they rebuild for a while? Or? <clears throat> well, you have to understand now, about half the battalion is new. Mm -hmm. Truckloads of soldiers are coming in, and we got a new battalion commander, a new uh, uh, operations officer, mm -hmm. um, super guy, Frank Willoughby, is now the uh, S3, and he is you go back and uh, start the, the uh, Battle of Long Bay, which is way up north. Mm -hmm. He was the, the A Company commander, special forces guy at that camp, at that battle. Where they got attacked with tanks. Yeah, that were, they were overrun at that they point. They overrun. Got a tank sitting up on the top of his operation center. The Marines wouldn't come and get them. The Army mm -hmm. had to come in there and dig them out of that. It was a, it was a terrible battle. Yeah, but the, he was uh, my boss. Mm -hmm. He was the S3. Uh, so you have all these new people, <clears throat> and we've got. Uh, there are now they're really on a stand down, mm -hmm. which is take, take some of their, they try to take some of the troops to the beach, give them a little break, uh, time to clean your weapons, 
clean your radios, get, make sure everything is working right, new batteries, uh, refurbish the battalion. But the, the one thing you can't do is let this battalion is in this emotional state now, mm -hmm. sit in the rear. Yeah. So I don't remember. I, it was just days later that we were air assaulted out to Cather, Firebase Cather. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so there we are again, out, out, out in the jungles west of Hawaii. Yeah. All right. Now, were you normally going to be with the battalion headquarters, wherever that was, or would you be in the field with the battalion? I was. I spent almost all of my time in the field with the battalion at the battalion headquarters at the fire bases. Okay. Even the, I mean, to the extent of even when they went one time when they went back on uh, uh, <clears throat> back to base camp for a week, I actually stayed out and with the at the fire base. Okay. To keep things, uh, one thing. Well, let me tell this little story. When I first got there. The, the idea was to have electricity done by little gasoline generators, 1.5 and 3 kW generators, and um, those generators were never designed to run 24/7. Mm -hmm. They're little, you know, pull a rope and crank them up and. You know, but that was supposedly was what's going to power our radios and all this sort of thing in the top. So uh, it wasn't. <clears throat> can't tell you exactly how we did this, but I came up with a 45 kW diesel generator. <laughs> <laughs> we stayed there about a month, then we moved to Rockasan, and I brought that generator into Rockasan under a Chinook and placed it, sandbagged it in, got droves of diesel fuel, and we ran, uh, I provided, I was, you know, uh, providing electricity for, for the fire base. I had fluorescent lights at the top <laughs> at Rakasan. And then you make sure that you put uh, lights in important places like with your artillery in their operation center and so forth, because they can do a much better job if they have lights mm -hmm. and, and so forth. So yeah, I, besides combo, I did lights. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yes. Now, what was the battalion doing at that point? I mean, they're on these fire bases, just general patrolling. Yes, the the, the typical thing you 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 establish the fire base, put the battalion headquarters on the fire base, bring in the, the um, 105 and the 155 artillery, um, plus the various other sundry things that happen, engineers and and uh, that, that sort of thing on, on the fire base. Primarily working on the bunker line. And that I had to learn with, with my fellow officers. And, and don't get me wrong now, when you join an infantry battalion, particularly then in Vietnam, and you're the combo officer, yeah, you're the combo officer, but you're infantry too. Mm -hmm. You're gonna be right in the middle of it all. Filling sandbags and getting your crews on and securing the things. And, and, and uh, after the lessons of ripcord, uh, perimeter defense is really important, and you have to learn how to do that. Mm -hmm. You don't just go out there and throw some concertina wire out there. You know, it's it's uh, uh, Raleigh Rollerson was Delta Company commander here mm -hmm. in Ripcord, and right mm -hmm. after that, he uh, well, he became BS4, but uh, I, I considered him as one of the experts on knowing how to build that. Mm -hmm perimeter defense, taking three strands of Constantina and nailing it down to the ground about yay high and then put more Constantina on that and nailing it down mm -hmm. and down so it's a solid barrier. Plus the play more mines, the food gas and the fighting positions and you make it really because we're dealing with sappers mm -hmm. and as the ripcord story goes, the sappers were a big part of that too. Mm -hmm. and so you have to really learn how to uh, do perimeter defense, and I was a big part of that. Of course, I was, I was, I did all sorts of things at battalion. I was the, the talk officer at night. Uh, had uh, walked to bunker line, inspecting fighting positions, doing all those infantry things too. Mm -hmm. Besides being cabo, you know, you, you just you don't sit there and don't know I'm the cabo officer. That, that doesn't work. <laughs> so you learn to do all that sort of thing. All right. Now, how long did you stay in that job? Well, started in July and it went till the next spring. 
I believe, uh, till about the 1st of March, something like that. Mm -hmm. And then what did you move on to from there? Uh, I became um, a signal officer for 1st Brigade, 1st Brigade signal officer. Okay. And where were they based? Camp Eagle. Okay. 1st Brigade is Camp Eagle, 3rd Brigade is uh, Camp Evans, 2nd mm -hmm. Brigade was off wandering someplace. <laughs> All right. Uh, now, what did those duties consist of now? Uh, in, uh, where at it? With the brigade. At brigade? Yeah. Well, you're overwatching the various battalions, uh, uh, and what they're doing, of course, distributing all the codes for secure radios and what we call back then the, the SOI, Signal Operating Instructions, making sure all that gets done, uh, talking to the brigade commander, future operations, which well, he'd call me in and he told me what we're going to be doing six, a month, six weeks from now. Mm -hmm. We had a big operations that went out in the, back to the ASHA and so forth, and he had me uh, Pick where he should put his brigade headquarters out there so that he can talk back to Camp Eagle and, and cover the area that he was going to, which took a lot of work because you're doing basic map reading and profiling mountains and we're predicting where the radios are going to work and not work mm -hmm. and then actually jumping on a helicopter and flying out there and sitting down on the ground and testing it. <laughs> right. Just sort of did that. Now, were you still there when the Lamson 719 operation oh, yes. took place? All right. One of my additional duties, so, while well, I was with, uh, well, after we first got to Catherine, Colonel Bard says, well, get on a command and control ship and run over to this sister uh, fire base, and you're going to learn how to be a beacon drop officer. What's a beacon drop? So I go over there, and the commo officer there was a beacon, and he taught me how to do beacon drops. So explain what a beacon drop is. <clears throat> it's a way to drop bombs in your area, in your AO, when the weather is bad and there's clouds and the normal sets of air can't come in and bomb for you. Mm -hmm. there, uh, the Navy Marines fl flew A6s out of the Nang and um, that airplane would carry 22 500-pound bombs. And then I would be on a fire base, and the beacon drop officer, I had a PRC-41 UHF radio, weird-looking thing with a big fat antenna, to talk to them directly, and a transponder. A transponder simply works with the radar, it's just like an air liner flights today, they have a transponder in the airplane where they beep the signal and it shows up on radar. Well, this is the opposite. I've got the transponder with me, and this A6 is, you know, there's two people in that airplane, the pilot, and there's an electronics officer with radar screens and very sophisticated electronics. And it's offset bombing for my transponder, and I would feed them data direction to the target and degree and minutes, mm -hmm. distance and feet, see if I can remember all this, elevation differentials and his flight path that I wanted him to fly on. And he would gather all this information, he'd go out about 15 miles and then turn, and, and you also had to authenticate the transponder to make sure that they're looking at the correct transponder. Mm -hmm. But I would switch codes could switch codes from Alpha through Foxtrot, I believe it was, and they'd come back at you, and you'd do that a couple times, okay, we got you, and they'd go out 15 miles and start heading in, and you'd see them, their radar sweeping, your transponder, it's beeping, you're talking, and then uh, they had 22 bombs, and you could uh, vary things like, um, you could drop all the bombs at, on one spot at one time, or you could have a stick lift of three or 400 yards, you can have first bomb on target, center bomb on target, last bomb on target. You can vary us all this sort of things. And they would drop bombs. Mm -hmm. And it's the way that you get a lot of bombs through bad weather. Right. And I got, because, the secret of this thing is, is that your batteries are charged. Mm -hmm. 
for your transponder and your radio. Either one of those failed and the mission's gone. Well, I had my 45 kW generator and I knew how to charge batteries. <laughs> so I was always ready. Mm -hmm. And I got a reputation of uh, being uh, a reliable beacon drop officer. Because mm -hmm. they would, you know, they'd go someplace else and if it failed, they'd divert them to me. Mm -hmm. So I was just dropping bombs all over the place, you know. <laughs> all right. Now, this came in response to my asking about Lamson 719. So 719. Okay. Uh, first of the 506 was up north already. Second of 506, where I was at, uh, was still, I think we were at Firebase Jack at that point. I don't, but all of a sudden, the word came down for Captain Lissy to get, get your beacon drop equipment together, select one soldier to help you carry equipment. Helicopters coming, you're going to go north to. Uh, the first of 506, because they don't have a beacon drop officer and they are completely surrounded and they're getting mortared heavy and they need bombs. Mm -hmm. So, it shows Freddie Pitts, a black soldier from Mississippi, good soldier. Ready? Pack your ruck, let's go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, sure enough, first they flew us the case on. The next morning we got a Huey and we went into that battalion headquarters up in the on a ridge up by the rock pile, mm -hmm. and uh, sure enough, we were surrounded. You actually hear enemy talking at night, and flame wars going off all night, and we were digging our hole, and we get in there, and so I was there to put in beacon drops, and Freddie Pitts told me that if I could ever get him back to Camp Evans, he would stay there the rest of his life and never complain. <laughs> get him out of there. And, uh, it was it was pretty bad. And I remember bringing in an eight-inch artillery just over our shoulder, same ridge. We're on this knoll and an enemy on the next knoll, and just pounded that thing with eight-inch artillery and, and sent the, a squad or two down there, and boom, they got hit bad with homemade clay mortars and so forth. Uh, vivid memory of the heli the medevac hoisting up an injured soldier with mortar rounds flying and dropping through his blades. And he took off and that had to turn hard and that soldier's hanging, that injured soldier hanging on that end of a jungle penetrator mm -hmm. at about 45 degrees. And then you don't know, I don't know what happened to the guy, you know. And a couple of guys got killed that day and bringing that back and it was, it was a bad place. Okay, now was this sort of uh, was this battalion in the position where it was kind of supporting the operation in Laos? Yes, at that point? Amer Americans were up north fighting enemy while U.S. helicopters and uh, South Vietnamese Army were heading into, into Laos. Mm -hmm. We finished that mission and funny, you know, things are crazy. Uh, we caught a Huey back to Dong Ha. We got on QL1, a lot of traffic. and. Uh, Flagged down a uh, trailer truck, army. Mm -hmm. It was it was full. Of, the cab was full of junk. I crawled in there, and Freddie sat on the fifth wheel. And we went <laughs> back to QL on the front gate of Camp Evans, and came back into Camp Evans. And I remember that the, we had captured uh, some homemade clay, uh, homemade clay mortar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, big. I mean, just explosives, just full of all kinds of nails and stuff, you know. I brought that back just to sort of show, show and tell, because mm -hmm. sure enough, the second of 506 went up there later. But it was a pretty bad place to be, yeah. All right, uh, now, during the uh, course of the year you had in Vietnam, did you get an R&R? &R? Yes. Where'd you go? That was uh, in April of, uh, after I'd gone to 1st Brigade, I'd, it was towards the end of my tour, yeah. and uh, went to Hawaii to meet the wife. Okay. And uh, she'll tell you, I was the, the last guy on the last bus. <laughs> <laughs> she had just about given up. <laughs> I finally wandered off, and I was kind of, I guess, in a uh, pretty bad emotional situation back then, seeing everything I'd seen and so forth. And, we actually uh, got to Honolulu. We took a flight, went to Kauai, to uh, 
to Hanalei Bay in the North Shore. And I woke up the next morning and it was raining. And there was jungle everywhere. <laughs> Turned on the TV and there was John Wayne with a machine gun. <laughs> said, wait a minute, I was supposed to be a partner. <laughs> yeah. No, it was good. We had, we had a good time in Hawaii. All right. Are there other things about that Vietnam tour that kind of stand out in your memory? Well, of course, you see it, you see it do a lot. Uh, all types of situations where you come close to being killed. Mm -hmm. And also that was from, not from enemy, but just being it, just being there. When you have that many soldiers, that many weapons, you know, an RPG flying across the windshield of a loach. Uh, we had to distribute uh, what we called the funny papers, because mm -hmm. everybody was required, by, particularly right after Ripcord, to have a secure radio. And there are codes that they have to punch into this what we call the gun, the KYK-28, and you punch it into the KY-38 that provides the encryption for secure radio. Mm -hmm. But you can only give out seven days. And each unit, including recon team, had to have a secure radio. So you have to, you have to visit every unit every week mm -hmm. to give them these codes. And usually, typically, you take a smoke grenade, which comes in a um, um, cardboard canister. You open it, you take the smoke out, you put the funny papers in, tape them up, and tape them to the smoke. So when you're in the helicopter and you see the guy on the ground, you pop the smoke and you try to hit him with it. Because <laughs> if you lose it, you got a big problem. Mm -hmm. Now the division's going to have to change, so you don't lose these funny papers. There's some stories of myself and uh, another fellow, combo officer, if you hang it in a tree, you get out on the skid, get down in that tree and get it back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, distributing those, all of that, and, and it took a lot, and uh, when the helicopter guys come up and you show them all the locations, and now uh, you can't just go with pop smoke at every friendly location, because you just located all the friendlies. So you do a whole bunch of false ones too. You just throw a smoke everywhere. Uh, so, uh, yeah, getting that done, a lot of helicopter time, a lot of helicopter time, just constantly flying in the AO and so forth. And the pilots show up and they get their briefing. And when you show them where the 51 cals are, the enemy has they they don't like to go there mm -hmm. <laughs> for good reasons. But uh, yeah, you spend a lot of time. Doing that, uh, they uh, <clears throat> no one ever. Well, the division didn't keep battalions in those mountains in the winter time because yeah. you give a winter monsoon. Mm -hmm. But boy, this year we're gonna keep one battalion out at Rakasan, mm -hmm. and of course that was us. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the first of October, it started raining, and it rained all of October and all of November. And in the middle of that, you look back at uh, your weather history, there was a typhoon, a big typhoon that came through at the same time. And reports are it rained 104 inches on us. Mm -hmm. And uh, we ate seas almost the whole time. And we didn't get out of there until the end of December. December was all fogged in, too. And basically, we had to walk out to, to get out of there. And, and a uh, brigade commander at that point, we had a new brigade commander, and he was upset with soldiers not having dry socks. That's always been a thing in the Army. Mm -hmm. Always keep a pair of dry socks, so. And uh, starting to have foot problems. And you tell your sergeant major to go out there and teach those soldiers how to have a pair of dry socks. And the sergeant major comes back and says, man, there may not be any dry socks. <laughs> when it rains constantly, mm -hmm day after day, week after week, and then he said, okay, Colonel Bard, you go out there and show them. But he said he sent his own sergeant major out there, and his own sergeant major came back and told him, he said, you know, there's no way, nothing's going to be dry. Everything is wet. And, uh, and it sure enough was, we came out of there at the end of December, and I remember, and particularly Charlie Company, having to carry him off a helicopter to the aid station. Their feet were hamburger. Yeah, it took 10 days to, before they could walk again. So that was 
<clears throat> gosh, there's so many things that uh, stick out in your mind about that. Uh, yes, first casualties, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. How much contact do you have with the South Vietnamese military? Not a lot. Uh, we pretty well operated independently. Yeah, they were in the area and this sort of thing, mm -hmm. but uh, specifically us, the battalion headquarters. I don't, I don't know what the Viet, even Vietnamese people, because mm -hmm. there was no population in these mountains. It's us and North Vietnamese. When you were on the big bases, were there South Vietnamese there? Uh, they they'd go on big bases. <laughs> it's been a while. Uh, well, at, at Camp Eagle there, when I was brigade signal officer, yes, there were some Vietnamese there, but not, not many. Right. Yes, it was uh, Camp Evans. It had, there was no what you call house boys or house girls mm -hmm. or any of this. We didn't have any of that. Yeah, and there's no village outside the gate or anything like that? Uh, there were, and I guess they ran a laundry someplace, but amongst us, uh, soldiers, uh, even in our base, base areas, uh, didn't have them. Okay. This tape is about up, so we're going to pause right okay. here. Rewind. All right, now we were kind of tying up some pieces of your Vietnam tour. Um, one question I've got is about uh, the, the morale of, of the troops in, in, in the field uh, when you're there. What was that like? Because you joined them after the, the battalion has been decimated and rebuilt and so forth. And what impression did you have of the soldiers? Well, you know, it was a, a mixed bag. We still had <clears throat> really good soldiers with good attitudes and so forth, doing, doing a good job, but then there was always that element of um, uh, and commanders having a hard time with who, who's going to be in the field and who's going to have to get not to be in the field. Mm -hmm. That was a, a really big deal if you could get get back to the base camp and stay back there. And uh, so they had to play that game. Mm -hmm. uh, you had to problem with, of course, marijuana was back in the base camps was a big deal, but in the field, I won't, I'm not going to sit here and tell you there was none, mm -hmm. but the troops pretty well policed themselves out in the field because they, they knew they were in a, a situation where, you know, you, you, you screw this up, you're going to have a sapper come in there and get, get you killed, so they, they wanted those his fellow soldiers to be on their toes and so forth, so it kind of took care of itself out in the field. But, problems back in the base camps. I, I spent very little time in the base camp. I, I pretty mm -hmm. much stayed out in, in the field. I'd, I'd take a, a small crew with me, but of course you had to run the switchboards, um, run, uh, run the um, uh, battalion and brigade radio nets with my radio operators sitting in a talk mm -hmm. and keep the battalion logs going and that sort of thing. So that was, that was a, a big job mm -hmm. of keeping that going. And I had, I had some really good signal guys, radio operators that uh, did that sort of thing. And were you aware of problems in the base camps with racial issues or harder drugs or things like that? Yes, there were. There were I remember one soldier going berserk and shooting a rear area up and so forth. And, you know, those sort of things, but I, I just hear about them because mm -hmm. I was out in the field yeah, with them. It's not really what you were you yeah. know, seeing out, out there. I'll tell you another little story. Right after Rip Cord, we went, we were at Firebase Catherine, and we were only there for, and I don't remember precisely, uh, maybe less than a week when, uh, and I was out trying to get a light bulb in, in, in the artillery. Uh, battery area for them to help them out and of course we didn't really have any supplies trying to use combo wire and put some uh, lights give them a light bulb mm -hmm. and out, out there with my self and we're digging trying to bury this cable in a, a Huey helicopter which not was uh, working for a battalion in an adjacent area to ours got misoriented that night saw a light on our fire base and decided it was enemy with flashlights. Mm -hmm. So he came through machine guns blazing and strafed our fire base. Mm -hmm. And I got caught right, and that was my first time getting shot at. I didn't know what was going on. Mm -hmm. I had all these little 
red firecrackers bouncing all over the place, all around me and so forth, until I, about a second later, I figured out this is not good. And I rolled over and got inside a, a bunker. But uh, that day, we had received our Quad 50, which was each fire base, or so far north, that you had a uh, Quad 50, 450 caliber machine guns mm -hmm. for air defense. If something does come over to DMZ, it's, you had some firepower. And that nervous Quad 50 team had just test fired their Quad 50 against the side of the mountain. And the misoriented helicopter went around for another pass was, was coming in. The Quad 50 guys were on the Quad 50 ready to shoot this enemy helicopter when a radio operator who was been, had some experience, he was monitoring Brigade Net and he put two and two together. Mm -hmm. He heard what was going on outside, he's real sharp, and he gets on the radio and, and calls them off. Mm -hmm. Or else we would have had a helicopter shot down that night. They did hit one soldier who had just survived ripcord. Mm -hmm. He was in a fighting position. Um, he had seven days to go before he goes home. And he took an M60 round in his groin and up through his intestines. And uh, Dr. Harris, Jim Harris, was our battalion doctor. So we run down there and I'm, I'm helping with the stretcher. We pull him up through the barbed wire and get him up by the battalion headquarters and medevac coming in. Nothing a doc can do for a guy with that type of injury, but the medevac was there. It's, it's dark now, mm -hmm. it's night. And uh, we get him and get him in the medevac and uh, as they're taking off, they're barely 10 or 12 feet in the air when they start hovering into the cloud. Because clouds come down at mm -hmm. night and they just did that. Of course they just fly down the mountain and go away and they got, they got him in. And uh, Dr. Harris, a few years ago from now, found out who that soldier was and that he lived. Mm -hmm. and we did, of course, in Vietnam, that's the big thing. Guy gets injured, he's gone. Mm -hmm. That's the end of the story. You don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, and apparently that soldier lived. Okay. And that's, I, always, I always remember him. that soldier laying on, uh, on that stretcher and he grabbed his buddy by the shirt and pulled him down. I said, you find out who's flying that helicopter. <laughs> I don't know what ever happened to that, but he was a little hacked that he survived ripcord, was getting ready to go home. Here comes the helicopter, shoots him. So, right. yeah, there's lots of those stories. Uh, terrible. Okay. So, uh, now you kind of get to the end of the Vietnam tour. Uh, and so, when do you leave Vietnam? July of 71. Uh, okay. All right. And where do you go next? I go to the Signal Officers Advanced Course, Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. Okay. And almost everybody in that course now, there's 50 of us. Boom. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have, I think it's nine months, ten months of advanced course, Signal Advanced Course. How do they fill that nine or ten months? Do what? What do they do? Oh. Well, all the, all the, uh, all the branches of the Army have those advanced courses. Mm -hmm. That's how you... I <clears throat> go from uh, captain to major. Right. And uh, gosh, you get classes on all kinds of stuff. You know, uh, from, from basic electronics through all the signal equipments and organizations to, you know, all that sort of thing. It's, it's just a normal thing. It's, okay. But by then, this is now getting to be um, going into 72. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, after nine months of training, the Army is having a reduction in force. And uh, half that class got rifted. Mm -hmm. After nine months of class, they're gone. Now, did you have some seniority on them because when you had gotten your yes. commission? Yeah. I, I was late in getting to advanced course because my assignments and the mm -hmm. way they went. So I was, I was actually the class leader. I was a senior guy in, mm -hmm. in that class. And uh, so, yes, they, in this, when you take a, a, all these guys that just got back from Vietnam and put them in a class, mm -hmm. 
interesting things happen. Right. <laughs> They're not the, the best behaved students around. <laughs> oh, yeah, most of the funny things happen. You know, uh, so it was a lot of fun. And then following that, uh, I became an instructor for a few months, and then I got selected and attended the uh, uh, course that was basically taught by AT&T, but at Fort Monmouth, and uh, to become a communication systems engineer, where you study everything from telephone switches to microwave systems, tropo scatter systems, cable systems. Uh, that sort of thing mm -hmm. for, you know, the, the opposite of the, the green box of the tactical equipment. Now you're talking about the commercial equipment. Okay. And was this a period when they were computerizing things or miniaturizing things or, uh, or not so much yet? Not, not so much yet. Although, yes, we had the old IBM 360s, I guess they were, with the punch cards, that sort of thing. That's, that was that phase. Yeah. Uh, it was, it was uh, during that course. I remember uh, we had uh, some civilians with us too, and, and uh, we had one uh, from uh, Hawaii, and his unit uh, gave him a calculator. Calculators had just come out. Mm -hmm. and pretty soon we all had a, a calculator, but he had a sophisticated one, you know, and so forth. Wow, look at this thing! It just punch numbers and calculates for you. Mm -hmm. Uh, what was that? Texas Instruments had a T something or another. Mm -hmm. It was just yes. So that was a a big step in technology there, just to get a calculator. So all right. And now with this training, once you got it, what do you do with it? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> got assigned to see a pack. So, uh, Communication electronics engineering and installation. Uh, Pacific. Pacific. Yeah. So. We're stationed in uh, in Hawaii. Uh, some military commanded by a colonel, lieutenant colonel, deputy commander, um, a bunch of captains, and uh, about half civilians. Uh, were you civil still service people, engineers, and so forth. Were you still a captain at this point? I'm still a captain, and. Uh, our main mission was to rebuild COM systems in Korea mm -hmm. because Korea had been neglected all during the Vietnam War and all of their systems were really old and falling apart and so forth and we needed to rebuild Korea. So a lot of equipment was taken out of Vietnam and Thailand, sent to Okinawa, refurbished and we bought lots of new stuff and we basically rebuilt uh, uh, the backbone of Korea. This is before satellites. Mm -hmm. And so it's the world split up by Army, Navy, and Air Force as to who's responsible for communications and so forth. But uh, uh, we had a tropo system coming out of Japan, shooting across in the southern part of South Korea. Did a microwave system that went throughout Korea, mountaintop to mountaintop, and down to post camp stations and uh, telephone exchanges, cable systems. And I've been to almost every place in South Korea that a GI can go to, mm -hmm. including every mountaintop, every post camp station. So I got a, a lot of Korea. <laughs> All right. Now when you went to Korea, how long a time, would you go for a few days at once? Or Sometimes weeks? it'd be two weeks. And I remember one time it was, uh, I think three months going and you know, you're chasing down projects. You're, mm -hmm. you, you do site surveys, see what's there. Um, come back and get into the big plan of what's, what needs to be replaced. Order equipment. Once equipment comes in, you have installation teams that come and install. Mm -hmm. Then Q&A people behind that to test things, get everything going cut over from old systems to new systems. It's a pretty complicated process to fix a country like that. Now how did Korea compare with Vietnam in terms of your impressions of the place? Well, to 
me, Vietnam was just my, my unit uh, in the mm -hmm. mountains, infantry unit, yeah. fighting a war. Okay. As, as far as the country goes, I know very little about it except that spot. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't travel around Vietnam at all. Uh, I don't think I ever went to a village or had zero experience like that. Mm -hmm. with, uh, you know, you, you'll see a lot of other GIs, oh yes, and they go to dinner and they, if they you're the guest of honor and you have to eat the head of the chicken and all that. I don't know anything right. about that. <laughs> we were right. out there in the mountains eating sea rations. <laughs> so, uh, Korea, of course, I experienced uh, a lot with, with the local people because we'd go to areas where GIs aren't normally there, the, at a town with a mountain top next to it with a microwave system. Mm -hmm. and, so you intermingle with them and, and, and stay where GIs don't normally stay, and so forth. So yeah, Thailand was to me the where I really related with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Totally different. I, that's my favorite place. Those mm -hmm. people really loved our country, and they loved their king and their queen. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they, <clears throat> it's just a different place. Yeah. You know? I mean, did the Koreans seem to recognize why you were there? Or oh yeah, yeah. sure. Uh, they, uh, you know, you hear all the stories about Korea. Mm -hmm. What they are is they are strong people, physically strong, no short legs, and put an A-frame and lift up a drum of fuel or walk off with it. You know, <laughs> it's unbelievable. Okay, so at that point, it wasn't really developed in the manner that it is now. Oh, now it's a very uh, modern, industrialized country with better internet than yes, ours. They didn't. They didn't. They didn't have uh, the cars, mm -hmm. so forth. Now they all have cars, but they don't have the roads. <laughs> so, uh, but no, it was. But we we traveled and uh, we had some uh, Toyota Land Rover type mm -hmm. vehicles that we drove ourselves. We took. Uh, the blue train from Seoul down to Busan actually flew with and with Korean Airlines from Seoul to Busan. Mm -hmm. Strange because you put the people in the back of the airplanes and there's no door to the cockpit. Solid wall bolted. They come in through windows mm -hmm. into the cockpit. <laughs> okay. Nobody's gonna hijack that airplane. <laughs> uh, Stories like that and take the uh, Greyhound bus. And you take what we call the kimchi bus that in the remote areas that are really rough roads, get back in there and get all this stuff accomplished. So, yeah, we got a lot of Korea time. Okay. Now, how long did you spend in Hawaii? Or what, what three, and a half, three and a half years in Hawaii. Okay. Loved it. And were you going back and forth to Korea the whole time, or just for part of it? Korea and other places, Taiwan. Mm -hmm. you know, guys would go to the Philippines, uh, Japan, Okinawa. Uh, most of my work was Korea. Mm -hmm. I became the deputy commander after a while. I got promoted to major and became the mm -hmm. deputy commander. The last year I didn't travel much. Mm -hmm. uh, the other people would be going out and staying in Hawaii at that point. Okay. Uh, now you're in the army in this period when they're kind of Vietnam is over, uh, the army is downsizing, shrinking, and, and so forth. It's become an all volunteer army. Uh, did you notice any? effects of those things aside from other officers getting rift? Oh sure. <clears throat> After Hawaii, uh, command and staff college and then out to Fort Ord, California, 127th single battalion, part of, obviously it's part of the 7th division. Mm -hmm. And uh, lots of soldiers, big battalion. And one of the, it's now Volar, Volunteer Army. Mm -hmm. uh, Standards for coming in the army, what do we call that? Cat four, take category four soldiers in. What does that mean? Uh, low IQs, mm -hmm. very low standards, uh, all kinds of soldiers coming in. The single battalion was one of the, the battalion the division who had females. So we, in our battalion, it was maybe 600, we had. Roughly, I think we ran about 110 females, <laughs> so you had that that mix. Also, so uh, yes, yeah, so lots of troop problems. Uh, the, uh, I always thought it was silly, but the, the division commander required the battalion commanders to have a three by five card in their pocket with every soldier who was 
coming up for re-enlistment. He had to know all their names and interview them and beg them to stay in the Army. And a lot of them we didn't want in the Army. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> it was kind of nuts. So. Now, did a signal battalion get uh, better qualified personnel than line unit or do? Not really. Okay. They were poorly trained coming out of the schools. Uh, We had all our, we had, you know, all the troop problems, lots of troop problems. Now, and had, good soldiers too, don't get me wrong. Okay. We had great soldiers, male, female, they all come. Like the same, I remember our soldier of the year in our battalion was a female soldier. She was great. She got out of the army and a few months later she married a platoon leader. Oh, you know that was going on. <laughs> Yeah. Did the uh, female soldiers? I mean, did, I mean, did they having them available? Did that help you in terms of having people with talent to get stuff done, or did they perform about the same level the men did? Same level. Okay. Really, really bad ones. Really, really good ones. Just like the guys. Mm -hmm. They come big, small, smart, dumb, all kinds. Yeah. So, what years was this that you were there? Seventy-eight to eighty-one. And what was the, and you're out in California, what's the attitude of the people in the community to the soldiers and the military? Well, uh, of course, this is Monterey, California. Um, they're used to having the military. Mm -hmm. The Naval Postgraduate School is there. Mm -hmm. Beautiful facility. Uh, basically, I guess they really enjoy having the economy of the Army there, mm -hmm. but would just as soon not have the Army there. Uh, I remember all the uh, meetings you'd have to go to and uh, see if they would give permission to shoot mortars. Forget artillery. That mm -hmm. makes way too much noise. You can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a silly place to have an infantry division. It rains in the wintertime. The grass grows up 18, two feet high. It turns uh, brown in the summer. It's crispy. Any little spark is going to set off a forest fire, so you can't shoot any weapons. You can't do anything like that. So all the training has to be accomplished uh, uh, far away at uh, Yakima, Washington, or Fort, Fort Irwin, California. And it takes a set of tires just to get there. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just, so yeah, it's, it's a nutso place, and guess what? It's closed and it's gone, mm -hmm. and it, that makes sense. It's it's not a, a good place to have a, a real army mm -hmm. infantry division. Yeah, the training was very basic training, that sort of thing. Yes, but not you know you really can't do very much out in the field at Fort Ord, California, without burning it up. <laughs> All right, uh, and then now from here, what do you do? Well, uh, then I got assigned to uh, Fort Sam Houston, Texas. Going to Texas, finally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Always volunteer for Fort Hood, which nobody wanted to go to, and I could never get it. <laughs> but that's typical of, you know, requesting something in the Army. So then uh, I got assigned to Fort Sam Houston. I was director of telecommunications for the Army's Health Services Command, okay. which is the command that controls the medical school mm -hmm. plus all the hospitals from Alaska to Panama and the continental United States. All right. Uh, that sort of thing. Now, has the technology advanced some for you? Oh, yes. So now we're in the early stages of computers, uh, desktop computers. I see, I got, I think I had a, a desktop computer in 83. Uh, our commanding general at Fort Huachuca basically uh, sends us all signal guys um, a message saying I got these things called desktop computers are coming there's going to be one on every desk and there's no school <laughs> uh, I recommend you just go get one and start training yourself mm -hmm. and the army had just uh, had a, one of their first contracts out with Zenith what was it called a Z100 it was a dual five and a half inch floppy disk 
computer and you had to load the operating system each time you turned the computer on. Mm -hmm. Wow. And you could do word processing and a couple little things. So we started from there. Mm -hmm. and just, yeah, you know, train yourself. Because, you know, you're out there in the leading ditch and nobody else knows either. So I so was bringing in the first computers in the Army. Yes. And, um, and then we, uh, I guess my main accomplishment there was to do the early work with our computer guys. Uh, the medics had their own ADP core at that point they did, to do medical automation. And working together with them, uh, we did uh, trying to bring on systems in hospitals. The first ones were a pharmacy system, an appointment system, a system called KPOP, Computer Assisted Practice of Cardiology, where you could uh, actually do a, an EKG and send that EKG to somebody knew what, how to read it and send the results back. So you could use his expertise and other than the immediate area of where he was. Mm -hmm. So we had these basic systems and we were installing them in uh, various beta sites and hospitals and testing them, and getting them going. To, uh, those were the early stages of what today is the composite healthcare system, I believe it's called, something like that, which automates everything mm -hmm. in the hospital medical records to pharmacy to whatever. So it was a lot of work and we enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Sounds like an interesting job. Oh yeah, it was good. Right. And was the Army getting a lot of, uh, were you getting kind of better quality people in there to do Oh this? sure. So well now you're, you're at a big medical headquarters that yeah. you're dealing with pretty top notch people. So it's not a signal and, and, yeah. and, and the uh, yeah, the Army's getting better too. Mm -hmm. Yes, in the early days of Bolar, that's and then Category Fours and that sort of thing. Those were tough days trying to and, and the turnover back then. I, our turnover in the 127 127th Signal Battalion, late 70s, early 80s, was 125 percent a year. Wow, which means people are staying on average less than a year. Yes. Yeah. So you you get this company platoon. And start training them, and two, three months later, half of them are gone. All these new people are coming in, and you start training all over again. You just constantly. And this was at the point where it was decided that we're going to show the Russians, and we're going to have, what was it, 16, 17 full divisions. Mm -hmm. We're going to be a big army. Well, it's kind of a fake army because we, you didn't have your basic equipment even issued to you. Our signal battalion didn't have some of the, the major elements of multi-channel equipment that we needed. It wasn't even issued. So, uh, <laughs> what do we have here? You know, it's, but it worked. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> we won. All right. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, when do you finish then at Sam Houston? 85. Okay. And I had my 20 years in and I was thinking I'm going to retire and so forth, and then the Army gave me this, put this little carrot out there to go to uh, Belgium, to NATO headquarters, SHAPE, Supreme Headquarters, Allied Powers, Europe, yes. All right. And With a specific job. Okay, and what was the job? To go over as my, as a comp systems engineer now, mm -hmm. to uh, be in charge of building uh, uh, Basically, the the bunker for shape, mm -hmm. uh, uh, shape or headquarters, uh, huge project. Uh, three buildings, eighty meters long, four stories high, buried underground, under very tough mm -hmm. uh, conditions, and to be where NATO is going to fight its war, fight its fight the Russians from, mm -hmm. basically, it was that it was, that was all about. And uh, so... And what sort of team did you have to work with there? Well, this is a joint assignment where you have Army, Navy, and Air Force from 15 nations all together in one headquarters. <clears throat> okay. And how did that go? And my 
joint team with all U.S. Army Signal Corps officers. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, it was, uh, you know, we were all U.S. Signal Corps. Had a great team. Uh, very complicated project. Uh, there was an Air Force Lieutenant Colonel who was ahead of this before I got there. I took over from him. He was born in Russia. He was an electrical engineer, very bright, and did everything in his head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he left. Oh. <laughs> it was basically, I said, probably overstating that, but uh, gosh, it was, there was no master plan. So they had all these contractors ringing and all these boxes under their arms and all these sophisticated systems going on all over the place, and, and now we've got to put it all, all together. And uh, everybody was laughing at us, and you know, there's no way this is not gonna happen. You know, there's no way you can do it. We did it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Basically, it's built just outside uh, Shape Headquarters. You got the above ground headquarters where all those 42 generals mm -hmm. and staffs are offices, and now you've got this underground bunker. Next, it's right next to it because when General Bernie Rogers was was the sack your the decision was you're going to go and hide this thing in the Ardennes forest and so forth and satellites now are going on and you're not going to hide the thing not a project that size mm -hmm. and he said build it right there as he pointed out his window and it's, that's where it was built and uh, so basically uh, you have these doors a lot of security and uh, when the balloon goes up certain people from the above around headquarters come into the bunker close the doors and I guess everybody else is expendable and they fight the war from there. Mm -hmm. Luckily we haven't had to do that and I have no idea what the situation is today. I don't think anybody knows how much it costs to do that project because you're basically dealing with, uh, and, and the, the budget guy who worked for me too, he's a great super guy, Notre Dame graduate. Uh, and. Uh, he would have to is go to Brussels and appear before the committee to get the money to do the next step sort of thing. And he just did a terrific job of it. He never failed to come back without, you know, and it was all done mm -hmm. good. And it's, and we finished that, we got that project finished before I left mm -hmm. in three years. It was, it was cut over and ready to go. So. Yeah. And there's another case where you're, you're living in a different country, how did people there view you? Oh well, you're living in the, on the French border in southern Belgium, French speaking, who pride themselves in being a little better than French in mm -hmm. cuisine. <laughs> it's not, it's, it was no problem at all. Mm -hmm. Very good, good relations, yes. Yeah. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, when you work at a place like Shape mm -hmm. uh, with all of these generals and people from all over. It's funny because they all laugh at the Americans because the Americans are working like crazy and they're not working so much. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> they're taking their one month vacation. I don't know, with the, when I first got there I had a, my desk across the other desk to desk was an Italian lieutenant colonel. And of course the Americans, for lunchtime we go do PT. We go run. You got a PT test coming up. You got to stay in shape, and so you're out there. And, and this Italian says, "Yeah, I think uh, it's about eleven o'clock. I think it's PT time, pasta time." <laughs> <laughs> so he gets off for the cafeteria, and we go run. So <laughs> he'd laugh at us, crazy Americans. But it's true. I mean, you see, when you observe the Americans are just working their tails off. And, now, while you were there, was this getting to be the point where oh, this is Ray was Reagan president at the time? Yes. Okay, and then a lot of the push against the Soviets or the oh yes kind of face down sort of thing. We were we were really head to head with, and we'd like to think that our building that war headquarters and uh, getting it completed and ready to go might have had a little bit to help accomplish that. Because mm -hmm. you know, we had a pretty secure place to fight a war from.
and it was yes. a point when our technology was kind of getting ahead of theirs. Yes, and we were out spending them, and our military was growing strong. And, and uh, this is a compartmented facility where you have a job where you and you're allowed to go to that part of the bunker, but no place else. Mm -hmm. Security was really a big deal. It took a half an hour just to get into place, and uh, but. Uh, I had a go anywhere pass because I was given the tours because you're going to get very high ranking people from various countries coming mm -hmm. and find out what's going on, where's the money going, what, what are we building, this sort of thing. And at one point, uh, Margaret Thatcher and President Reagan were supposed to come together. Mm -hmm. said, oh my God. <laughs> it didn't happen. You know how those okay. schedules yeah, go. Yeah. It didn't happen. But, uh, yes. but uh, I've given, given some tours with some very high ranking NATO personnel from various countries come through and I take them on a tour of the facility and show them what's where. It's a very interesting facility. We don't talk a lot about it, but a lot of stuff is classified yet today, I'm sure. Yeah. So, now, uh, And then when did that tour come to an end? In um, 88. Okay. All right. And then you've got one more assignment then yeah, after that? Yeah. From there I uh, was sent to Fort Knox where <laughs> I first started, All right. where my daughter was born and baptized in the chapel there, and you're in that tour, she was buried in the same chapel, <laughs> one army career later, and uh, I became the director of information management for the Armor Center, Fort All Knox. Right. All right, on a practical level, what did that mean? Uh, you're the chief signal officer, but they're giving you a whole lot more uh, stuff under your wing. Ran the printing plant with about 52 employees. The Army has a few printing plants, mm -hmm. and that was one of them still going. Uh, you, obviously, you run the, uh, the telephone system for the post. You have a big telephone switch and all of those people. You've got a communication center sending messages in and out. The library, the, the records management, uh, just all sorts of things. Anything to do with information is sort of under your purview. A lot of people, so yeah. So that's that was. Uh, but you wanted directors at the armor center. Okay. And armor guys are good guys to work with. Enjoyed it. All right. And then the Gulf War happens toward the end of that. Yes. Assignment. And what was your perspective on that? Or well, Gulf War was an armor war, mm -hmm. and I'm at the armor center. Right. So it's a very busy place. I mean, we were working hard, uh, trying to assist, you know, here, there, and yonder. Everything from personnel to equipment to logistics to tracking stuff, and sending people. So it's, it became a very busy place. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, it turned out great. And those armor guys would come back and give their speeches. Yes, they were a lot of them, some of them were classified, but mm -hmm. you learned some what happened. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Did a good job. Yeah. Uh, the big thing of course was our, our tanks weren't ready to go. And why Saddam allowed the US Army to bring all these tanks in from Germany and all these other places and retrofit them in Saudi Arabia and sat there and watched all this till they were ready to go. And they finally, you know, it took a long time when it first started until we actually came across the border. But uh, they all had to be retrofitted, not only with some weapons and so forth, but primarily um, chemical warfare, all that sort of thing. It was a lot of work that had to be done. Mm -hmm. So, and it got accomplished, mm -hmm. that happened. And it was over, over very quickly. Yes, a, few, a couple of days and it was over with. So, uh, what finally motivates you to retire? Oh, it was time. Okay. <laughs> I'd had 26 years in, and, and the, it gets harder to go from, uh, up from each level, doesn't it? So, oh, lieutenant sure. colonel to colonel is a fairly yes, big job. I don't know, but it's the early days in Vietnam, and like my job, petroleum in Thailand, I said, oh my gosh, this is what a, I just made captain, and this what I, mm -hmm. that much responsibility, what am I ever going to do if I would make major? Well. Mm -hmm. I probably had more responsibility then than I did later, because you know it's the Vietnam War started and 
Yeah. We were all just young guys and lots of work needed to be done and you got a lot of responsibility very quickly just to go get, get stuff done. Mm -hmm. and it, I think it worked out pretty good. Americans are good at that. So when you did finally retire out of the military, uh, what did you do after that? Um, in 91, uh, with the economy the way it was and so forth, jobs were very difficult to, to uh, obtain. I mean, you know, finding, finding jobs. Uh, but we, we went back to San Antonio, Texas. That was, you know, uh, we didn't go to a job. We went to the place we wanted to be. Mm -hmm. And my wife was, uh, even before I retired, a few months, she had already moved to San Antonio, and she's a librarian. Mm -hmm. She had, she, while we were at Fort Knox, she got her master's degree in library science and got a job in the, in the, system, in the school system in San Antonio. She was there already, and then I came. Our youngest son was, uh, has already left Fort Knox for Texas A&M University, so we had no children with us anymore. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I went back, and uh, long story short, I, I invented a chemical paint stripper. I've always been a woodworker, mm -hmm. that sort of thing, and uh, was quite successful at it. And uh, I actually got it patented, mm -hmm. and uh, kind of got into that uh, business, and did a lot of um, assisting and um, not only lead paint removal but historical restoration. Mm -hmm. Texas uh, spent, I don't know, $500 million, I believe it was, something like that, restoring old courthouses. And the architects would use me and my product, mm -hmm. but I'd have to go teach the contractors how to restore these beautiful old courthouses, which were basically built with a lot of beautiful woodwork, mm -hmm. doors, windows, wainscoting, that sort of thing. It was all varnished. Varnish turned dark and people started painting them. Mm -hmm. Maybe they might have 15, 20, 30 coats of paint. Wow. Show them how to remove all that and restore all the woodwork. And then I did a lot of historic buildings across the country. Did uh, the Calhoun House at uh, Clemson University, where they were trying to restore that's a historic building mm -hmm. in the middle of Clemson with a lot of tradition to it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Calhoun was vice president under Grant. And that, property became Clemson University and they couldn't figure out how to do it and I helped that and I actually um, worked on Robert E. Lee's house at uh, Arlington National Cemetery taking the paint off those columns up front. I thought that was quite an accomplishment. Yeah. <laughs> so did that and then uh, <clears throat> uh, always been a, wood, a woodworker interested in that. And um, basically, uh, now I'm fully retired, mm -hmm. and I do mesquite woodworking, where I harvest mesquite trees in Texas, mill them into lumber, and uh, then build high-end furniture items mm -hmm. from that, which is quite popular in Texas. Okay. I've just completed a project for a church, an old church in San Antonio, building the, the chairs for the priest and the altar boys for the church. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess a week from Saturday we're having a big blessing of the chairs and that sort of thing. So it's a tough project though. Gosh, I worked myself to death on that one. <laughs> All right. Well, the whole thing makes for pretty good stories. So thank you very much for taking the time today yes. to share it. Thank you.